Right. Well, we are in our series in the book of Ecclesiastes, and uh, as we've been looking at this, we've been talking about <laughs> um, what it looks like to face the void that we all feel as humans in our life, what it means to actually engage this life and engage it on the terms of what actually is versus what we desire things to be. How do you face life knowing what it is uh, without having this Disneyland syndrome where you walk into Disneyland and escape real life and just have that fun for the five or six hours that you're going to be there and just to enter back into real life? Ecclesiastes says that, no, we're going to look at life and we're going to actually face it and we're going to be honest about it. And as we're being honest about it, we're going to get some wisdom as to how to actually engage and deal with it. And as King Solomon, as he's most likely at the end of his life looking back and he is uh, in retrospect, he's just looking at all the things that he kind of placed all of his hopes in uh, in order to fill the voids that we fill and that we experience in this world. As he's looking back, he's saying that, listen, these are the different things that I turn to in order to fill the, the voids in my life, in order to get away from this thing that we call vanity, which vanity is this, this, this filling and also this truth that everything that we experience in this world it has this temporal effect on us. It's, the word there is breath. It doesn't have lasting value. You know, when you want to enjoy something, you want to hold on to it. Why is it that it escapes you? Why does it seep out like air? Why can't you hold on to it? He says it all is vanity. And he's going to look back and say, listen, here are all the ways that I actually tried to do that, and I failed. So we need to lean in on the wisdom of Solomon Lean in on the wisdom of someone else so we won't do the same thing. And listen to how he starts off this section of Scripture this morning. You would have heard Alex say, So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What has this brother so angry right now? What leads him to hating life? Why does he feel such strong emotions right now? Why he all in his feelings? What's going on, Solomon? Solomon is feeling something that no doubt you have experienced in pockets of time and pockets of life as well. Why does he feel this way? And why is he so grieved? I believe he calls himself the preacher. The preacher now turns his attention to the failure of pleasure that we talked about last week. He says, that, listen, last week in my life, I was looking at pleasure to fill this void, but even that's vanity. He says, so now I'm turning to something else, another bucket of meaning in life, and that bucket is work. He says, I turned to work, and I explored it, and I, and I tried to fulfill myself through it, and I have a conclusion about that that leads me to grief. It leads me, and here's the thing. This is why this is so important, because most of the time, especially in the West, we don't get this point into the end of our life. We don't get this point until we get to retirement. Don't wait till retirement to get this point. Start with the end in mind and then live in the present. Start with the truth of the matter. And he's trying to give you the truth of the matter as it pertains to work. And let me tell you, before we get into uh, the points here, listen, there are several ways to talk about work. We could talk about the beauty of work, which you'll hear a little bit about that. You talk about how God could use your job and, and use you um, and how you can bless other people and how he can work through your life at your place of employment. We can talk about calling. We can talk about all those different things. But that's not the message that we're going to be talking about today. Today, we're going to be talking about the limitations of work. The limitations that we so often overlook regarding employment, regarding career, regarding our identities wrapped up into this thing. And the conclusion that grieves him is verse 18. And that's what we're going to work through right now. It's not just 18, but it's going to start off in 18. And then, and then he's going to give you the reasons why after building on top of chapter, uh, verse 18. So I want to look at uh, these three points of work that we can kind of grab from this this text this morning for our lives. Okay, the first one we're going to look at is the inequality of work. The inequality of work. Solomon is going to look at work and say that, hey, there is something that is uh, unjust or unjust about, about this work thing. There's something uh, that we can look at and say, hey, 
where you can experience in your life an injustice when it comes to work. Okay, let's uh, pick up on verse 18. He says, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. This is a part of what makes him so angry and so upset. And we'll get into the context here in a second. So, because I know in our context, we say that, wait a minute, I thought that when you leave something to your person, that that is a, a, um, a sign of pride and a sign of, you know, uh, a point to enjoy and to celebrate that you are able to leave something to your offspring. Well, we'll see here in a second why he is so upset about this. Because it's not so much that it's because he has to leave it to someone else. That's not really the, the issue here because he himself is the recipient of his father's kingdom. So that's, that's, that's not it. It's, it's something else. But he's saying, look, listen, there is an inequality here. He says, this is vanity. This is vanity. There's three observations that we can get from this. The first observation is going to be skepticism and despair. Solomon says that as I work and as I look at the end of my life and as I'm sitting here with all the riches, I'm a very rich man. I have accumulated a lot. I'm a very wise person. And as I sit here, skepticism and despair are both setting in. Why? Because who knows with the recipient of all of my hard work, who knows what they will do with the fruit of my labor? Who knows what's going to happen with everything that I worked for? Who knows? This is why he says in verse 19 and verse 20, and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. He started this section off at the beginning of the book in chapter 1, and now he's returning back to it to discuss it in more detail. He says, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. Or the word of uh, translations will just give you the word vanity, which is a better translation, I believe. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. Others are receiving what they did not uh, toil for. This is not just an ancient issue or uh, something just in antiquity that is of concern. It's of concern even for us today. This idea that what I'm working for, and I don't care how big it is, I don't care how small it is, if it's something that is precious to you and you have to leave it behind, it's important to you, and you want to know that everything that you left behind that is going to be taken care of. This actually happened a couple of weeks ago, which I thought this is very interesting, and it makes a great point for us today um, in terms of modern-day example. Let's look at this next picture here. Um, there we go. All right. Yeah, I know who the, who's this man right here on the left side of the screen. All right. There we go. All right. That's a good guess. That is not Walt Disney. That is Walt Disney. Okay. Very good. Um, Walt Disney. Okay. And who is this guy? This is his grandson. All right. You know what this, they were just in the, not him, but the estates of Walt Disney estates uh, was just sued by the grandson for over $200 million. Why? Because they said that, wait a minute, you said that I can receive so much, so much of the finance and so much of my inheritance by a certain age, and I'm of that age, and I'm ready to figure out where is my money. Okay, the, the Supreme Court just struck that down. They said, no, player, you don't get the money. All right? Why did they say that? They said it for the same reason that Solomon is so concerned about right now. What do they say? He says, listen, we got to put some caveats in this thing. I know that you are the rightful heir of it, uh, but here's some caveats. One, maturity and financial ability to manage and utilize such funds in a prudent and responsible manner must be demonstrated. And they say to this brother, you didn't demonstrate that. Well, I don't even know what all that means, but the point is, is that people are, they care about what's going to happen with their money. They care about what's going to happen with the stuff that they worked for. They don't want it squandered. And what Solomon is doing right now, he's saying, listen, I'm concerned with everything that I have been investing in is going to wash away. And it's not just that. It's everything, not just money, but, but my name and, and my empire and, the, and the, uh, everything that I built with this kingdom. What's going to happen with this thing? I know that most of us, we don't have $200 million to pass on. We don't have huge estates to pass on. So you're like, how does this relate to me? We the con. I'm a common person. Some of y'all may be rich. I don't know. I'll tell you how it relates to all this to us in a second. Verse 21 says this, For a person may labor with wisdom, he says, knowledge and skill. He says that's not the only thing. It's not just about money. 
He says, listen, I'm laboring with everything I got. I'm giving it everything I got. And I'm, I'm leaving it. And then they must leave it all, all they own, all they built, to another person who didn't toil for it. He says, this too is meaningless. This too is vanity and a great misfortune. And what this is, this, this, he's saying this truth under the shadow that he just cast with, in regards to death. Death brings all into perspective as it pertains to the vanity of all things. The fact that I'm going to die, i got to leave this stuff behind. I can't take it with me. What does it mean? Which is why we have to start with the end in mind. If we're going to talk about work, the thing that we do most of the time in our life, if you're college students, is the thing that you will be doing most of the time in your life. What does it all mean? you got to start with the end in mind. He says, what's the actual payoff of our labor? Verse 22, what do people get for all the toil and anxious striving for which they labor under the sun? And he's going to give a couple words that we can associate and that we can relate to, whether you are working at McDonald's or whether you are working uh, in, a, in, a, in a mansion, whatever, wherever you're working, we've all experienced this as it pertains to work. He says, the grief, the pain... And even at night, your minds don't rest. If, anybody, if you experience that, raise your hand at all. Yeah. If you experience it, like, look, you're tossing and turning. You don't know if you're, the look your boss gave you, well, does that mean he about to have a conversation with me? Was it just a bad day? You're, you're all nervous and whatnot? The person, the new person came in. Oh, man, they, they working better than me. Uh, okay. Are they trying to upset? Is this all a plot against me? You get paranoid? Whatever the case is, you've stayed up at night. I've had some restless nights with pastoring. Yeah. I've had restless nights in terms of like, I, I want to be here. I don't think that I'm far enough along in my career, and, and I don't know what's going to happen. What am I going to do in life? He says that this is a part of the work. And at some point in life, you kind of figure things out and figure where you fall at, and then after all that stuff is figured out and built upon, you go. You die. And you got to leave it behind. All right, we down yet? All right, don't, don't worry. Wait till the end. And listen, the issue here for Solomon is not so much that he can't take it with him. That's not the issue. Like this is not like like the like the the pharaohs of old, you know, because they was like, look, look, I'm gonna leave the kingdom to you, but we're gonna take some of that gold with me. They have this all over the world of people of kings and rich people dying and taking with them their gold as if they can take it with them. You can't. That's because of this desperate. Uh, measure to deal with the reality that, listen, I want to take what I built with me, but the Jews realize something more accurate. You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. You got to leave it to another. You got to leave it to someone else. You have to leave it to whatever's going to happen in the world. You have to leave it behind, which is going to give a better understanding of what all of this means. It's not so much that he can't take it with them. Rather, the issue is that he can't protect the fruit of his toil. I can't protect it. And part of this, it leads him to despair, which that is going to be a part of really the, the language shift here. The language and how he's using this in the Hebrew, and when he uses the word despair, I turn to despair, is that I was once on, at this point, I was once here, meaning that when I explore the issue, I turn to uh, work in order for it to fulfill me, and then I found something out about work, and the conclusion has now shifted me, and now I've turned to despair. That gives us two things as we close this point. One, work is not producing the life of meaning that I thought that it would. That's one of his realizations. That's the fact that he's, 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 now, into dis he's now in despair. Okay, I'm building infrastructure, systems of operations, strengthening commerce, trade, along with military might and other things. It's not producing the life of meaning that I thought that it would. Two, I am dis now disillusioned because of my disappointments about work. Maybe you've been there, and maybe you're headed there. It's good to understand this right now so that you won't have to get there. Understand it and let it sober. And Jesus has something to say about this before we go on to the next point here. Jesus has something to say to us. Matthew 6, 19, he understands that, listen, Though if you only concentrate on what you can build in this world, you will be thoroughly disappointed. It will not fulfill you the way that you want it to, you want it to fulfill you. 
Verse 19 says, what? Jesus says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. That's right. Testify with me in mind. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, or even where the recipients that you give it to will somehow do something different with it. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where there neither... Uh, where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's a fundamental shift that Jesus is going to take from where work and where our concentration of treasure and the, t- the fruit of our toil, where our heart, what that should be in place and located. We'll talk about that as we close the sermon a little later on. All right, second point here out of three. So now he says that, listen, there is some sobering realities that I realize about work, okay? But that's not all that can be said about work, all right? So let's let's jump up for it. Let's let's go into upper for a second here because he says that, listen, I realize something about work that is true that we've all experienced, hopefully. He says that not only is there an inequality or an injustice about this thing called work, there's also an enjoyment of work. That's an enjoyment. He says, I give you that. I give you that, all right? So, So point two. It says, though work can be strenuous, it can be very satisfying. All right, so let's read in verse 24 what it says here. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God, for without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? It says, this is from God. God gives this. It is satisfying. We talked about this in week one, when you can actually do a job. Some of us get off on it. We love this, and I love this. I'm... Uh, A type of person that, listen, if there's a lot of craziness and chaos going on, I get much satisfaction with bringing it into order. This is why I used to manage major warehouses. I used to love putting systems into place that would produce beautiful results. And I would just stand there and say, I love this. I'm eating it up. I geek out on that stuff. Now, I'm not like that with cleaning. Some of you all, like you have a good time with cleaning. I don't get that. I don't understand it. I'm sure that God has given that as well. There are different things that people really enjoy about work and is quite satisfying. And there's a reason that it's satisfying. It's satisfying because work is from God. God gives this thing called work. We learned this in Genesis 1.28. And Solomon just acknowledged this in the verse that he just, we just read in verse 24 and 25. But we also see this in Genesis 1.28. 128, we're called to subdue and rule. Subdue and rule. This is a part of the Adamic call for all of humanity, male and female. God called you to function in the world by taking things. and Not people, not subduing people, but helping and living in the world in an efficient manner, helping things out. He says, that's actually part of why I, I made you. I think Tim Keller says something here that's very helpful here uh, for our understanding this morning. Let's uh, see this quote here. Keller says that without meaningful work, we sense significant loss and emptiness. People who are cut off from work because of physical or other reason quickly uh, discover how much they need work to thrive emotionally, physically, and spiritually. It's a part of what God has given us. I want to work. You want to work. Um... People that are able physically to work, the best thing that we can do is help people get to work. It's a beautiful, beautiful gift. I used to give my life to helping people find jobs and, and work. It's beautiful, and, and there's something that, uh, that we don't want to take for granted. And he says it's, it's enjoyable. It's enjoyable. See, we experience some light. So, you know, you feel lifted up now, right? You feel great. All right. <laughs> now let's get some more truth. <laughs> This is true. He says, listen, it's enjoyable, but it's insufficient. It's enjoyable, but it's insufficient. So our last point this morning is that we look at the incompleteness of work. It's not complete. It doesn't complete you. It is good to realize Solomon's conclusions here as soon as possible as we live in a culture that says that, listen, what you do will complete you. Your job will complete you. Strive, get after it, get it, get it, get it. And, and listen, we, know, we see here that the, the, the second point there, that it is enjoyable. It is something that you should uh, work for and strive for, work hard for. Go to school. If you want to go to school, get your, uh, your licenses, whatever that is. Whatever God, the Bible says that whatever you do, do unto the glory of God. And I don't care if it requires a degree, certification, or just being good at it. Do it. 
Do it well. All right? But do not get it twisted. It will not complete you. And so let's look at this uh, four quick things here as we are going to close our time here. One, when he's looking at this, Solomon saying that, look, man, it's not going to complete you. It's not going to do it. And so the first thing that we need to look at as a point of application is work and identity. We have to get this right right here. Work and identity. Your work cannot define you. We learn here that, listen, from this, these applications, that work does not and cannot complete us. And so the thing that can't complete you shouldn't define you. You understand? The work, if, if you have something in your life that you're looking forward to completing you and fulfilling you, it will define you. And when the thing doesn't deliver, you will find yourself crushed. And I don't care if that's a relationship. Oh, yeah, we turn to a relationship to fulfill us. That can't fulfill you. It will never deliver. And you will find yourself forever trying to get it. Work cannot fulfill you. So you cannot put your trust in it. It shouldn't define you. And the question we typically ask is this. When we're in our social circles, in, in this world, uh, typically in the West and in America, we ask the question, what do you do? Right? Hey, so what do you do? Uh, cocktail parties, whatever you're going to at your job, whatever. What do you do? Ain't nobody going to no cocktail parties here, but you, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> what do you do? We typically say that that means, really, we interpret that as, who are you? And how important are you? Let me have a quick honest moment here. I get this question often, you know, from, uh, from whoever I'm talking to. A doctor recently uh, asked me, hey, wh so, so what do you do? You know? Well, in light of the fact that I took a less poll, pastors used to be in high esteem. You know, you used to be able to say, um, you know, I'm a pastor. And people are like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know? They, 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 they'd be like, oh, my, did I just say something? Hey, and they be talking about how moral they are. Like, look, 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 look. I can't give you something. Don't worry about that. I, you're not impressed. These days, they say, oh, you're one of those, huh? Uh, right. Oh, yeah, this is, kind of, this is falling out of favor now. So I'll be finding myself tempted to, like, you know, buffer it a little bit. You know, I'm, the last time somebody asked me, this is an honest moment. I'm not saying it's right. I'm, I got clay feet, y'all. Uh, that means that I'm fallible. Somebody asked me, he said, what do you do? I said, uh, what don't I do? That's why I told the doctor. <laughs> And being that this is the last time I saw a doctor, that was pretty recent. <laughs> I, said, well, I said, what don't I do? I said, uh, I said do something with non-for-profits. I sit on boards. I said, I'm a pastor. Uh, <laughs> you give this, laid out your whole life. You know, I've done this. I've done that. Me. And I've done all of this stuff. You know, and they're like, I didn't ask you that. But, okay, you're a pastor. That's what you do. <laughs> What are you doing presently, man? If we start with the end in mind and realizing really the vanity of work, we will be okay saying whatever we do and be okay with it. No matter if it's in favor or in, in, or in season or out of season. If you're a barista, you better own that. Yeah. And if you're a pastor, you own that too. It doesn't define you. It's not your identity. I, I love what, uh, what, what, what Keller says here again. Uh, Keller, he, he has this book at really about work that I've really benefited from. Uh, we'll go through some things when it comes to idolatry and how the idols uh, in our lives, especially in the West, how it drives us to answer these types of questions a certain way. Like what's behind that, which is a form of idolatry. But he says here that if the point of work is to serve, uh, not this one right here, but if the point of work is to serve and exalt ourselves, then our work inevitably becomes less about the work and more about us. Our aggressiveness will eventually become abuse. Our drive will become burnout. And our self-sufficiency will become self-loathing. All of these are, are, are forms of idolatry, things that we're allowing to sit on the throne of our heart to drive our behavior. And then truth is going to just stare us in the mirror and say that, uh-uh, won't deliver. And it's going to drive you to some abusive behavior. And then he says here, listen, I want you to see this here. This is very helpful. Um, yeah, right here. There we go. Okay. Um, he says, personal idols profoundly drive and shape our behavior, including our work. Idols of comfort and pleasure. If it's, if it's going to be an idol of comfort and pleasure, it can make it impossible for a person to work as hard as is necessary to have faithful and fruitful career. Okay? If it's an idol of power, and approval, on the other hand, it can lead us to overwork our 
be ruthless and unbalanced in our work practices. Like you'll never get home, you know, uh, before seven or eight, always working, slaving day in and day out. And or if, the, if it's an idol of control, it can take several forms, including intense worry, lack of trust, and micromanagement. I'm just so afraid. I'm so afraid. And so it translates into everything we do. Solomon helps us to have a healthy perspective of work. It helps to pull it into perspective. Listen, our nation and how we do things is driving us into the, into the, the ground. And I, there's this African proverb. I was just reading a book the other day, an African proverb. I forget what the country of origin or the culture of origin it was. Uh, but they have a saying for uh, Westerners. They have a saying for Westerners. You know what they say? He it says, it's the word that means this. The people that rush around everywhere not getting anywhere. He says, they just rush around. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll call you later. We'll, we'll have lunch. Okay, we'll do this. Okay, I'm doing this. Thing. I'm doing this. Importance, 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 importance the stuff that we do. It's like, all that's going to do is cause a lot of harm for your body. A right perspective will allow us to relate to things appropriately. And so what is the Matthew 12 moment here as we close? What's the Matthew 12 moment here? Matthew 12, one greater than Solomon is here. One greater than Solomon. One that's here, a couple of things that we can look at. One is work in the gospel. Work in the gospel. God in his word is going to do things for us, listen to me, that's going to slow us down and it's going to help us to bring things to perspective where we're not constantly working and hoping that you have something filling the bucket that should not be filling the bucket. And I'm going to use something as an illustration here. Listen. He says that surely we say when it comes to God, we apply this. If we're going to apply this in work, we tend to apply to God. If I have to work for significance, that means that I have to work to earn God's love. Surely God's love is not as simple as it being a gift. Surely it's not something that I can simply receive and operate out of. I have to work for it. And what happens is, is that, listen, this will happen. This is happening in your life right now. If, you're, if you have a false perspective of this thing in terms of what things can deliver for your life, this is happening. What happens is you, you have several cups. And when one cup doesn't deliver, say the cup of pleasure, you take, that, you take it and you take all your energy and your hopes and then you pour it into another cup of meaning, work. And then when that doesn't deliver, you're going to take and you say, okay, well, I'm going to put my hope here. And the thing about humanity is that we don't learn the first time. We'll do a cycle. We'll do it over and over again. And you have, hey, didn't it? That didn't deliver, did it? You're like, no, I didn't deliver. So why are you doing this again? I'm, I'm caught in the cycle. Work cannot deliver. And it can't deliver in the gospel as well. And this is something I want us to hear before we leave this morning. God is going to tell us and hear God telling you, your work, your striving, it doesn't work here. It doesn't work with me. You and I believe that our striving will get us to fulfillment. And I believe so often, and maybe you do too, that those things that are outside of God will fulfill. And the problem is that God is the only one that can fulfill. And so we believe that we can strive to get to him as well. And God says that, listen, you cannot strive enough to earn my love. Hear this verse over you today, Ephesians chapter 2. This is the limitations of work. This is why work doesn't work as we hope that it would. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's not from you. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one may boast. For we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works for which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you see the order there? It's not by your work that you earn God's love, but you are the handiwork of God. 
And it's out of that that you are made for works, but you are a recipient first of love. So you don't work for God's love. You cannot do it, which one of the other ways that God is going to do and through Christ, one of the other ways that he's going to land the plane and that he's going to slow that us down in our, stri- our false strivings is that he's going to give us Sabbath. He's going to say, listen, you know what the word for work is? That when work is done in a way that's reckless, it's rest. That's the word. We learn in Ephesians, we, we learn in, in the book of Exodus. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord, your God. And listen here, if God worked for six days and rested on the seventh, how much more should you work? Should you rest? Work six, rest on seven. And I don't know what your schedule is. I don't know if you work four days out of the week. It doesn't matter. Are you getting Sabbath rest? Because Sabbath is saying that, Lord, I trust you. Sabbath is saying that, Lord, I didn't get everything I wanted to get done or I'm anxious about what's about to happen up this week, but, Lord, I'm going to trust you. And whatever happens, it's going to happen, but I'm going to rest today. And if you find yourself discouraged, overworked, you find yourself just saying, I'm coming to the end of myself, I'm running out, ask yourself the question, have I actually taken a full 24 hours of worship and rest unto the Lord? And lastly, you can rest because Jesus worked. And we're reminded of this every time we meet. We said it, Lord, we know, we realize that rest can, work cannot fulfill us. Work cannot fulfill us, and we also realize that our work cannot make us feel significant enough in this world. This is why we keep on doing it in order to feel more and more significant. And we can say that, Lord, no matter what I build in this world, I know that it cannot do what only you want to do for us. And you want to be the person that fulfill us and give us a sense of meaning and significance. And we're reminded of this in a very tangible way every time we meet. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, and gave thanks. He said that this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. That's what the gospel is. The work that I did is I came, I lived the perfect life that you couldn't live, I died the death that you deserve because of your sin. Sin separates us from God. I died and I resurrected from the grave. That's my work. That's where your identity is. Take my bread and eat it, that you may rest. Likewise, it's the cup and say that this is the blood of my new covenant spilled for you. Take and drink. 